uh, have uh, now the first panel discussion of the multiple uh, discussions we have planned throughout the day. And this panel discussion is talking about the outlining the digital roadmap in the new education model. We heard uh, in some context in the inaugural about the NEP uh, and as well as uh, how integrating technology and how technology is sort of catalyzing uh, the different uh, aspects and dynamics of the NEP. Uh, so this panel discussion specifically uh, will talk about how to outline the digital roadmap uh, for this new education model. I would like to call on stage uh, the panelists for this uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Rupa Vasudevan, founder and chancellor, Bharatiya Engineering Science and Technology Innovation University. Dr. Rupa Vasudevan, please. Okay, she hasn't reached yet. Uh, let me call Dr. Jamshed Bharucha, founding vice chancellor, Sai University, Chennai. Uh, Mr. Vishal Khurma, CEO of Voxen University. Ridesh Deshpande, vice chancellor, Ajinka D.Y. Patel University, Pune. Dr. Satish Kumar Bhandari, Vice Chancellor, NITT University, Mangalore. Professor GPS Verma, Vice Chancellor, KL Deemed University, Guntur. Not around. Uh, Yashwant Shiva Prakash, CEO of Audio Life School of Sound Engineering, Bangalore. Can we have Mr. Yashwant? And uh, to moderate this discussion, uh, may I request Dr. P. Balakrishna Shetty, Vice Chancellor of Sri Siddharth Academy of Higher Education. Over to you, Dr. Shetty, now. Good morning. Nice to have this uh, eminent panelist here. And of course, uh, if there is no mass, I think there is some class of audience here. So uh, what uh, we are going to discuss for the next 45 minutes is more of an uh, interactive session here because the audience have a lot of uh, eminent delegates, eminent uh, speakers here. We can have more of interaction rather than uh, one-way lectures. What I would like to uh, start uh, with uh, is that um, we have uh, multidisciplinary universities, uh, universities with uh, multidisciplinary faculties and multidisciplinary deaneries. Uh, as far as the digital education is considered, uh, we have got NEP now, but before that uh, we had apex bodies and for which we need to fulfill the curricular requirements as far as the apex body is considered. We have NMC, we have got EICT and we have got apex bodies for each and every technical uh, uh, professional schools. Uh, that's a number one. And after that, uh, we have got uh, the students uh, who do their own studies as per their requirement, maybe for their jobs or something like that. And we have the faculty uh, who are uh, uh, going to take uh, classes for these students. On top of everything, again, we have got NEP. Now the question uh, to all the you know, speakers today, how to balance uh, all these things? Like uh, you have got uh, NEP one on side, you have got uh, EPICS body recommendations on the side, you have got the students require one, uh, requirement on the other side, you have got the uh, quality or, or the experience of the faculty on, on, on side. So with all these four things in your mind, it is, uh, I do not know how the vice chancellors manage all those things. Apart from all these things, we have got multiple accreditation inspections, we have got a UGC inspection, you have got an NMC inspection, you have got an NBA inspection, you have got an inspection from all those uh, uh, bodies which tell you to do something as far as the academics is considered, teaching and learning is considered, examination pattern is considered, and above all, you have got your own student who wants to do whatever he wants to do because his career is very, very important for him. With view, the few things, these things in the introduction, I would uh, like to, uh, I, I'd like to have my discussion today. Now, first of all, with all these things, my first question will go to uh, Ridesh uh, Deshpande, who is an expert in designing curriculum, not only in curriculum, he's also expert in finding out how the, stu how the faculty should, how the faculty should do their uh, uh, classes, how the students should do the classes, because initially we thought it is only 
teaching, teaching, teaching. Okay, we used to have our own students within the four concrete halls, and the faculty used to give the lectures. Today, it is not the teaching because the students will learn something. The COVID has taught us that it is not the teaching; it is the learning. Students will learn from anywhere. They can learn from any school. They can learn from Harvard. They can learn from Stanford. They can from any school today, and they can come back to the classroom with all the knowledge in their mind. So, Ridesh Deshpande, if that is the situation, how would you, you know, how would you design the curriculum for your institution? You have two minutes, please. You can speak from there, or I can. You can speak from there. Also. Thank you, Dr. Bala, uh, for that question. A uh, very important question because uh, just to give you a little brief background in the sense of uh, because the entire education revolves around credit and credit is a word which has been very widely used and nowadays it's in vogue uh, due to the UGC and all those documents that are coming up which says choice-based credit system and whatnot. Interestingly, uh, the credit, uh, if you look at its birth, it was 1905. And uh, at Carnegie Foundation, it was then called the Carnegie Unit. I don't want to go into the entire story, but the story in, in short was Car Andrew Carnegie, who was the richest man at that time, left $10 million for a pension fund for teachers. And they, couldn't, they wanted to organize it in some way, and so they came up with this thing called Carnegie Unit. And that, then that became the standard unit of academic measurement. All through these years, it has always been about the teaching time because the credit as an academic unit was more uh, designed with the purpose of administrative aspects of what is the load, what is the factor, what are the resources required, and so on and so forth. There was never a student learning proportion that was ever added to it. Of course, in 2008 and uh, in the US and 2009 in Europe, the definition of credit, the new definitions came up and where they added the component of student learning time also. And that's where the thumb rule, the new thumb rule came about that for every one hour of learning, there has to be two hours of work that the student has to do himself or herself so then only that learning actually happens these two hours could be prior to the class it could be after the class it could be distributed and so on and so forth unfortunately if you look at any of the present document from the indian regulators this reflection is not there visible uh, irrespective of the fact, as universities, as uh, Dr. Bala said, we are responsible to our students for learning, to help them to aid their learning. And with that responsibility, the first and foremost part is that how can we uh, focus on the student learning rather than the administrative aspects of what are we teaching. The second thing is, uh, as, Again, taking a cue from what Dr. Bala said, there are so many things that are being told that the student should know this, the student should know that, the student should be taught this, the student should be uh, told about this, and so on and so forth. And in that, there is, a, in a very, very interesting manner, it, there is a maximization of education that is happening, which in my opinion should go the reverse. It should be minimization of education, that is what, how much education you actually need for the student to have so that you can do it in a more focused manner and where it could actually mean something rather than you teaching just what you want to teach and just because that is where you have to satisfy certain requirements. And in between these contrasting things, because on one hand these are the educational thoughts and on the other hand you have the regulatory bodies so it's a kind of a balancing act but then if you uh, do it with the right intent you can definitely balance it very well but i would uh, just like to say to close my on my point a is the student learning time or the student learning both are these are the important units of measurement as far as any academic process is concerned second is the student reflection because in our uh, teaching and learning, we hardly give impetus to 
uh, the reflection by the student in terms of to understand what the student has learned, how much the student have understood and what is the student likely to make use of and how. So those aspects we do not focus on much on. So the reflection is the third and the uh, second and the third would be the assessment that the assessment where especially the formative assessment in conjunction with the reflection by the student. These are, there's the trinity of these three things uh, with the oversight of minimizing education should lead to good results. Get back to you again with the questions, okay? Uh, the second speaker, we have got a great speaker here. Um, he has, is a founder vice chancellor of uh, Sri Sai University, Chennai. And he has worked abroad in Tufts University and he has also given lectures and he has worked as a faculty in Harvard University, Stanford University and Carnegie uh, Mellon University. Dr. Jamshed uh, Barucha here. Dr. Jamshed, I've got a question for you and I think uh, you can uh, build your talk on that. <clears throat> we have our education policies here, we do a lot of education here. But even then, we see a lot of students going from this country to other country. They're going to, most of the time, they're going, going to US. And if you see even in the US, the most of the leading doctors, the leading engineers, maybe in NASA, maybe in a lot of corporate CEOs, most of them are Indians. Okay, and often we feel whether the seed is bad or the soil is bad because our students go abroad and perform extensively. If you see there is a spelling bee, the winner will be an uh, Indian. If there is a math bee, the winning will be an Indian. If there is some competition, space, science, technology, and everything, most of the times we see the top Indians performing very well abroad. So this brings up the question whether the seed is bad or the soil is bad. And, uh, and definitely we feel that there is something wrong here. So what do you find right when the students come over to US, because you have worked as a provost, you have worked as a vice chancellor, you have worked as a dean, you have worked as a faculty, you have seen so many things happening there. Now, as a psychologist, also an expert in psychology, what do you feel, what we should need to do? Because you come back as a vice chancellor of Sri Sai, Satya Sai University in Chennai. So I would like to ask so that our delegates and also our, our vice chancellor will learn from you what, what should be the way, because now the students are bombarded not only with the curriculum, now they have to read so much of uh, morality, and so many things are bombarded, the like extracurricular activity. As a leader of all these things, how do you design, how do you give your psychological consultation, what is your uh, input on these things as well as the digital education, is there anything which students have to do, what is your uh, thoughts on this? Thank you very much. And actually is probably the most critical question. Uh, what is it, why do Indians fly abroad uh, and not so much here? And I actually, I don't hear that asked very often. I appreciate it because I think it's a dead honest question uh, that I've asked many times after 40 years in the US, I came back to India because of the NEP and the uh, re regulatory framework was cracking open and I saw for the first time. I'll be blunt about it and I'm, I'm writing an article <coughs> right now about it. <coughs> the higher education system in India has failed our youth, period. We inherited it from the British 75 years ago, including the UGC. And um, with all due respects to our UGC colleagues, the UGC has gone from bad to worse to tremendously damaging <coughs> to our young people in India. And uh, I, I, I want to give them a chance now that they are implementing the NEP, but don't forget, NEP called for the elimination of UGC <laughs> as a regulatory body, and I suppose it was not possible uh, for any government to, uh, to do that to a completely entrenched bureaucracy, so instead they asked the UGC to implement the NEP, 
And I commend them for their courage and some of the things they're doing. But I've done a lot of study of the Indian higher education system uh, since independence and come to this conclusion. There's only one truly innovative thing that India did between independence and NEP to really unleash this enormous pool of talent that India has. And that was the creation of the IITs, okay? it, which was so counter to the traditions before that. <clears throat> uh, and as we know, uh, has enabled Indian talent to reach the heights that it has achieved today by enabling India to be a leader in, in technology. But since that time, uh, the system has been more and more stultifying, and it's opening up now. I, as uh, was mentioned by our, a distinguished uh, moderator, having been in the US so long, I have taught Indian students from the other side and seen them coming. And it's very starkly clear uh, what happens. The traditional model of rigid curriculum, uh, mugging up, uh, high stakes examinations that determine the future, the, your future, has led to an unbelievable cynicism about the system by our young people. <clears throat> and uh, I say to my own colleagues on the faculty, and I see myself as being a faculty member, <clears throat> coming from the faculty, and to teachers and parents, you are the problem. Um, we need to lecture our kids less and listen more. Now that's so countercurrent cultural, okay? But we all know India has the largest youth population in the world. In fact, half of the university age population in the world as defined by UNESCO is in India. That's a staggering number. And the rest of the world today, when I was growing up in Bombay long ago in the 1970s, India was seen as a basket case, inside and outside. And now, you go outside India, and India is seen as this breeding ground for geniuses. But why do they not have the same opportunities here? And I think it's our system. My view is very radical. The government should get out of the way, full stop, and not regulate, except for uh, go good governance, corruption, all of these things have to be uh, properly monitored. Uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let everybody on this panel and out there who's involved in uh, reforming higher education, who's essentially genuinely focused on the children, on how their future can be preserved, let as many different innovations and ideas that are coming up by startup companies, by, universe, by, by education scholars and innovators flourish. <clears throat> and frankly, let the marketplace judge uh, what kinds of graduates uh, are the ones that we want. <clears throat> the uh, the high stakes exams, I, 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 I'll, I'll end very quickly. Uh, there are many points that the, UGC, the NEP touches on that I hope will be taken seriously. My own field, cognitive neuroscience, there's a huge amount of research now on how the brain learns. And almost everything we've done in traditional forms of education uh, actually opposes how the brain learns most efficiently. High stakes exams produce very strong short term learning, but very weak long term learning, uh, and squelches the innovative spirit uh, because you're just 
studying to replicate the question papers that occur year after year after year. Continuous forms of assessment are important. Testing, not just for assessment, but as a learning tool. So research shows is extremely powerful. So test every week. Test and divide the weightage of the course throughout the entire semester. And what that will do is the testing process itself improves learning. This generation, we all know as parents and teachers, students cannot attend to a 45-minute lecture. Okay. The top 10 or 20 percent of students in any college will attend. They will pay attention. They will learn for in any system. They'll do well. But the remaining 70 or 80 percent, uh, we are letting go. Now, finally, digital technologies I see what's happening today, which is a tremendous sea change that was facilitated by the pandemic as in its infancy. And I'm certainly hoping that in 10 years, whatever it is, we look back and see digital technologies used for much more interactive, humanistic, uh, problem-based, project-based kinds of learning so that um, it's more than just delivering lectures and, and administering exams. And so I would say, let's do justice to this tremendous talent we have in this country and empower them, unleash them. Each brain is different. Each child is different. You cannot slot them into science, humanity, arts, commerce. Uh, allow for flexibility to move around. And what you'll see is new economies emerging so that the new jobs, as we all know, are not going to be the jobs we know. But that generation, this, let the students' generation create that. It's their future. It's our job to give them a platform, not to tell them what to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baricha. Um, you are so artful in telling something. You straight away said UGC should be squashed. You boldly you said that, but uh, I don't know how. No, no, no. <laughs> no, the classically they say in 1992 India was liberated economically liberated by P V Narasimha Rao. Okay, India was liberated and India grown like anything. That's what they say in 1992. Lakshmi was uh, liberated. But the Saraswati is still not liberated. It is in the hands of UGC and all those uh, <laughs> accreditation bodies. That is, a, that is, a, that is a, I don't know what to say about that. And you rightly analyzed the student's psychology. And you said how nicely you said, because I also have worked in uh, University of Texas as a radiologist and Baylor College of Medicine as a radiologist. I know how students should be liberated, how they should be given autonomy so that they can blossom and they can flourish. That's a point, very good point taken. I think we'll take more questions. Uh, right now, we have got uh, one more great speaker. Uh, he has done extremely well in the corporate world. And uh, right now, the buzzword in uh, universities, industry, academia, collaboration. I'm a radiologist, but I don't deal so much with the uh, engineering college. But we do have a lot of engineering colleges. And we keep on talking about industry, academia, collaboration, industry, academia, collaboration, industry, academia, collaboration. We keep on repeating these stuff. We have uh, Vishal Kurma here. He's a, he's a stalwart in the industry. And he has done a lot of things in his, in his institution as a CEO. Um, and a lot of <coughs> industries he brought inside the, uh, in, the, in the campus. And he gave a lot of scope for his students to expose to uh, industry. He has done a lot of things. Uh, and he was a chief executive officer at the Oxen University, and uh, he was also board member of uh, many of these uh, corporate world. Vishal, <clears throat> we do speak about that, but you know, <clears throat> as uh, you know, as uh, a standard, as classically it is told, India and the Indians have got a lot of uh, suggestions. You know, as far as suggestions are con considered, we have got a diary of suggestions. As well as implementation is considered, we've got a serious constipation of implementing so many things. So industry, like a <laughs> yes, <laughs> industry, <laughs> academia, collaboration. I think this is still in the words, in the speeches, and everything. How do you actively or aggressively do it? 
what are the points required in each and every technical college, each and every engineering college of this country? How can we implement industry academy collaboration? Your points, please. For the opportunity. Uh, in my experience of, I'm not from the academic background, so hence uh, I don't have any baggages about how the academic institutions get run in the country or otherwise also. So I come from the corporate setup as you just pointed out and uh, my perspectives and the way we run Watson University also pretty much is in sync with how we think it should be run. And uh, of course, within the guidelines of what the re regulatory bodies are talking about or whatever the governance mechanisms are supposed to be there. But coming back to the question here about the industry academia uh, collaboration, what is required, let's understand a few things before we jump into this, our gross enrollment ratio in the country itself is 28%, right? I mean, we can keep talking about it, cribbing about it, that there is a lot of gaps which are there in the skilled students or the skilled labor or skilled workforce to be available to the corporates. But then, and the skill report also talks about that 68% of the people who we hire, they are not skilled from the Indian institutions, right? Now, why that is happening? On one side, you have just that kind of abysmal low level of enrollment ratio. On the second side, whoever is coming out of the institutions, they are just about two thirds of them who are not able to put them to use anywhere in any of the organizational setups. These organizations want them to work. Now, grossly, seriously, there is something which is not working in the entire academic as well as industry setup which is there in the country. My two cents on what I personally feel, uh, I have not done any deep study or whatever, but I, I have definitely done probably more than 5,000 interviews during my entire career of about 23, 24 years. And I have seen what kind of people we are looking at when I'm hiring from this side of the corporate side, and what I'm able to get when they're sitting in front of me and answering certain things about what they can bring onto the table. The corporate is brutally honest. They are brutally honest in terms of what they need in the corporate when they are hiring someone. They need X skill sets which need to come and they, this person should bring onto the table. And if that is not there, they will simply not go ahead with them. And if that is the case, and they are going to be brutally honest, they will not go for whatever your relationship with the academia is, then we need to change the ways in which we get our students skilled. Now today, the first key thing which I feel is, most of the institutions, we talk about 20,000 plus uh, educational institutions in the country and so on. And standalone, there's many more. Why the focus is only on content-based learning? The content which the student wants to learn, you have Google School available. You have YouTube schools available. You have many other schools also online available who are able to give that content free of cost anyways while you're running a university, man. You don't need to. So that content in any ways is available to the student and it is not a question of relevance also anymore. My younger one who's just in ninth standard, he is able to talk and see through how the coding is done without even going to and without even signing up for a BTEC program, by the way, thanks to Google, thanks to YouTube, right? So content-based learning is something which is, I think it's an old fashion it is no longer the requirement of today's India. What is required then? Context-based learning is what is important. You're talking about delivering certain things, certain domains which are required, but the students are not able to put those domain knowledge into a certain context. And that context is missing today when you interview somebody and you see that, okay, you may be knowing what a blue ocean strategy or a red ocean strategy is, but you're not able to figure out that how you're going to navigate your way if you're running a startup. 
you just don't know it. How the revenue model is going to work and how the P&L, commercial, is going to work for a particular organization, you are not able to do it because we don't have that context. That is not there. So that is the first point I would like to mention here, that context-based learning is very, very critical, which is about applied learning, experiential learning. The next logical question comes then, and sorry, many academicians would be there in this room. We are doing this, right? So what is so different you're talking about then? I mean, yeah, we, we do all of, all of this the entire day at the university campus. Yes, you may be doing it, but then is it really translating into the learning of the students? Probably no, because I think what when we think experiential learning, you talk about, oh, I have given them assignments, and those assignments are uh, in the nature where they would be able to bring their contextual knowledge or application of those concepts, which we have taught them in the class. But then is that enough? Probably no. You need live projects also along with that. You need many of those opportunities which are there towards ensuring they step up and get into a startup, get into a organization, get into a corporate before finishing their degree to ensure they are able to get the hands-on knowledge of what is required in the corporate world. Today, the students forget about the skills in which they can crack the interview. They don't know how to write the CVs. They don't know how to write the CVs sometimes. They don't know the CV is going to be the first thing which is, which is going to bring them onto a table in front of a talent acquisition lead of an organization who's going to interview them. And if the CV is there, you go through it, the CV is so bland and so, so myopic, you are not able to figure out that how would you invoke a discussion with the interviewer using the same CV. Because you have not done something relevant which you can talk about, you have not mentioned about it, you can't talk about what your learnings from the project was, you have not done the capstone projects, you have not done the internships, and if you have done the internship, you have not done it enough, and you have not done it with due diligence, what it was supposed to be. Right? So hence, I, I personally feel that a lot of radical thoughts keep coming and we keep debating. Last week itself, we have our governing body meeting for our university and one of my governing body member was talking about that, guys, why don't you start one year internship in your four year degree program? Now, to some extent to, to the conventional academicians, it may look like this is too much. What are you even asking? In four years, if one year the student is going to be completely away from the campus, how is it going to work? They will not learn anything. And then there's another school of thought which is there who says that even if four years they were staying at the campus and learning from you, what the hell did they learn? Right? And they were not able to crack the good jobs any which ways. So how do you really make it work where if not full one year, maybe after one year, three months, second year again, three months or four months, and then again, three to four months. So that's probably a kind of a model one can look at and, and all of this. So the bottom line is, I think the exposure with the industry, the interface with the industry has to increase in some form or the other, which has to be beyond the content, which has to be in relevance to the context of learning. Thank you, Vishal. Nice words. <clears throat> you said how content how context is important compared to con content. But I feel whether your faculty members are ready to you know, go away with the students, give them the context rather than the content, because the faculty members are always stuck on to the content. They are ready, they are always uh, on, their, on their foot to deliver the content, and they are not at all interested in giving the context to the student. I think that is a, that is the major problem you are facing in each and every uh, any institution. We need to, we, we may have to train our faculty members, and I, I don't know how to do that, because they always try to hold the students in a poor concrete hall as much as possible. When I, when, when I ask my faculty, they say, sir, I, how can I finish the syllabus? When they talk about syllabus, I know it is not syllabus, it is a silly bus. No student wants a syllabus today. Not a single student wants a syllabus, okay? He has got enough syllabus in this particular instrument called, you know, enough syllabus is there. You rightly said that. But how to 
take the students away from the uh, from the faculty members that need to be discussed we will discuss again right now we have another great speaker his position is uh, very unique he is a surgeon he has done mbbs and he has a ear neck and uh, throat surgeon and i also would like to tell you when we are speaking we are not speaking to about uh, 20 members sitting around we are if you are speaking to uh, satish bandari you may be speaking to around 20000 students okay <laughs> because he is a vice chancellor of anita university and more than 20000 students okay satish uh, the question is uh, we have again i told you you have got nep we have got ugc we have got nmc and you are managing a medical school you have got a uh, you have got mbba students okay sure. Sure. Uh, I don't know how much content is not, not not at all important for a medical student. The context may be important. There's a particular condition. There is a particular medical condition. What, how they should manage, it doesn't depend on NEP or UGC or NB or anything like that. It is a context as, uh, as Vishal has told properly. Now, how do you implement in your medical college this particular context, teaching context to your students? Uh, your, your thoughts, uh, Satish, please. Thank you, Bala, for the wonderful uh, introduction and also giving the perspective for this discussion. Since it is a skill-oriented conference, I'll restrict to my uh, answer also limited to that area. First of all, uh, I am a part of the deemed university. I'm lucky that I'm a part of the deemed university. I got a lot of uh, autonomy. So I don't blame the statutory bodies. As uh, Bala said, uh, medical education, dental education, and nursing, they come under the statutory bodies. But still, I don't blame the statutory body for all the maladies. I think, according to me, we are responsible for everything. Because I was also like Bala, we are teaching profession for the last uh, 35 years. So whatever uh, the maladies or whatever uh, has happened in, for the education, we, the teachers, should take the responsibility. First of all, I want to impress upon you about that and the administrators of the organization. Uh, as far as the medical profession is concerned, the father of medicine, William Osler, I think uh, you'll agree with me that he rightly said that medicine is an art or science. He said it's both it's an art and it's a science. But slowly what is happening is we are going, whether we want it or not, it's becoming more of science than art. Those days of healing touch, talking to the patient, is, it is going to disappear. Still it is there, fortunately it is there in India, but it is going to slowly. We, are, we have to imbibe a lot of technology for the sake of uh, giving better care, larger access to the patients, because India is a 1.4 billion population. So our curriculum or whatever you deliver in the medical colleges, or education institute, maybe nursing or dental also, should be oriented towards giving more technology also. If you don't do that, I think you'll in the next uh, one or two decades, we'll become totally outdated. So technology has to come, so we'll be definitely getting technology into the field of medicine. So regarding, regarding uh, how to get the technology without diluting the art of medicine, I think we've got a lot of responsibility. What uh, we did by my experience, I'm telling you, during COVID-19 has given a lot of lessons to us. It may be a, uh, a century, uh, one of the most biggest calamity the human race has faced. But we had to manage during those two years, I think, really the art and the science of medicine came to practice during that period. So we have, we have to learn, we have learned a lesson that is the future generation, such calamities when they come, our generation of, because I'm limiting to myself, even though I've got uh, other um, faculty, faculties in my institution, since uh, Bala has told me to mainly concentrate on the field of medicine, I will restrict to that area because my esteemed colleagues are representing various other technologies. What we did during those two years, I'm very happy to tell you that we got the one of the best universities for bringing online education for in the field of medicine or other areas because we are prepared. So we have to get prepared. Even though it's a, it's a, uh, initially we had a more of medical and dental and nursing colleges in the, under the fold of university, 
we brought e learning you even in the year, uh, way back in 2014 while well, we bought in we got it e learning thinking that in the head we may require this so we change we you know actually the our medical council or nursing council as a statute word is there they didn't ask us to get our students to learn e learning technology but in the year of 2014 with our own resources we bought e learning technology we prepared the modules for e learning we prepared our students and and the faculty for online education with our own resources we didn't get any technology from outside luckily we had some very bright uh, young uh, medical graduates or teachers who were ready to take up that onus so we did modules for training as we as you all know medical profession requires lot of uh, experiential learning then he thought i would uh, mo most of the time we blame technology how technology can give experiential learning because the more than the technology in the medicine we have to have emotional content also it's not only iq you got to eq also emotional content so you should have sympathy empathy how can a technology can teach us em emotional content so that is a big challenge so we brought e learning in the beginning but when the covid struck we were ready for delivering e learning technology so work in the virtual mode the biggest challenge was presenting the students the patients because they are not allowed because of the covid uh, situation they were not allowed to the ward they could not examine the patient though in those two years they were more of technology oriented training they were learning on virtual mode of training and but again technology came to our rescue we had established a state of the art skill lab because now most of the universities for the uh, institutions with medical it may be medicine nursing or other uh, physiotherapy or uh, dental sciences we have got skill based learning so skill learning now even the technology has come to the level even it can give emotional content also we have got uh, uh, the simulators which are almost they behave like human being so before putting the patients uh, in front of a trainee or a intern before going to the medical in the, into the ward he should be trained a skill based training he should have a exposure to skill based train training in the simulators so that's again technology how it's helping bring in the curriculum this all i am telling talking about it is not the content it is a context i am talking about so you have to prepare our young graduates whether it is whatever may be the field the medical professionals should be trained in technology as well as in with the patient before exposing to them to the patient they can be trained in a skill based learning so that's another issue regarding assessment again there's another big challenge see when the patient when a doctor is put into the practice he should be assessed how good a good he is at examining giving before giving a giving the degree he should be trained whether he is ready to be put into the practice so again here assessment part also how to bring the technology for assessment again i i think all of you will agree with me that even now it is a part of the uh, the digital evaluation we were we prepared the university for digital evaluation even module based because again the skill labs are equipped to handle assessment also so in assessment we had uh, technology the fourth component is a research component the research is a part of the curriculum nowadays even though whether the statutory body say or not research is very very important component of any university unless the students are trained it may be whichever be the field it may be engineering actually if you say the line between the medical and engineering is slowly disappearing a engineer has to be a doctor a doctor has to be engineer if you take it from me within next one or one or two decades this line between just because one person got one person list little mark he went for engineering he could have got uh, medicine if if he couldn't pay or something like that but that will not the fact actually a good a doctor should know engineering technologies a good engineer should know the biology this is going to happen again a designing of curriculum we have got lot of flexibility i think as admish i don't want to tell on more because of other uh, my colleagues are there but regarding formation of curriculum uh, assessment of the students and training the students is onus on the 
of the teachers, faculty. Our faculty should be trained. They should be motivated, prepare right modules, right medicine for the uh, patient or right medicine for the student to get trained in the universities. I think the onus is on us. One is on the teachers, one is on the faculty, one is on the administrator, one is on the vice chancellors. I think instead of blaming government and the statutory bodies, let us rise to the occasion to develop a curriculum and training of our faculty. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Vishal. Uh, thank you, uh, Satish, uh, for your inputs on that, how we can manage medical education with the perspectives of NEP, UGC, and all those things. We have a final speaker here, Ashwant Sri. And uh, all of the speakers, we felt that it is not the content, it is the context, but how the students should read, how to make the students to learn something, it is actually a challenge. You know, the, the, one of the greatest formulas of the century, it is called E is equal to MC squared, okay? Uh, but uh, in the context of Bhagavad Gita, I would like to say, when Arjuna wanted to fight initially, he said, I will not fight, okay? But after Bhagavad Gita, okay, the same Bhishmacharya, who is, uh, you know, a chamarani, nobody can kill him. The Dronacharya, their own guru, the Karna, and uh, Ashwatthama, who was a Chiranjeevi. Nobody, he, he never wanted to kill his teachers, he never wanted to kill his uh, grandfather. But after Bhagavad Gita, he will do everything. Now, if E is equal to MC squared, E is equal to mass into velocity, the mass was same, Arjuna was same, Sri Krishna was same, Gandhiva was same, the chariot was same, and the Hanuman was same. What changed before and after Bhagavad Gita? So the, the, the question of the, 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 you know, the, the rule of E is equal to MC squared fails miserably. As for the biology is considered, it may be the same for the physiology, physics, but not for biology. And I always tell my students, E is equal to MC squared. E, their M is not mass. It is a motivation. So E, the energy of the student increases with the motivation into velocity and the action. So that is my favorite talk on E is equal to MC squared. And Ashwant Ji here, he says, we can motivate the students with arts, science, and culture, and the music. That is his music uh, uh, platform where he wants to motivate the students so that their performance will increase. Ashwant Ji, your inputs on how to motivate our students. Okay, thank you. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity by uh, APAC over here. And firstly, it's an honor to be sitting with all the seniors around uh, in the discussion panel, and uh, hello to everybody over here, firstly. And as you speak, I think my particular uh, field, uh, that is entertainment and media industry, when I come from Media Entertainment Skill Council, a Skill India uh, initiative, uh, we have collaborated with them, uh, I think about since about 10 years at the present moment, and uh, officially it's, it's about four years to five years. Uh, so this is totally a different particular topic when we speak about music and audio, it comes out of uh, various subjects and, uh, you know, or topics which has been involved in a university. We focus on only one particular subject called audio. And we, it's in, into the entire uh, audio industry, even while I'm holding my mic again over here. There's a lot of technique. You know, I can't speak like this. I just need to have it over here. So that's a part of our partic particular syllabus, just the way you say that. <laughs> but again, it all acts as, uh, you know, techniques. And it's all about uh, basically uh, an experience by, uh, you know, having your uh, recording arts techniques or uh, you know anything which we would come up to make sure they are industry trained and you know they need to be uh, present to go and start working you know, uh, you know with a hands-on experience. So uh, we uh, were never uh, having an opportunity earlier. I think about 13 years ago, 14 years ago, while I was uh, probably finishing my 12th in 2002 and 2003, I never had an opportunity to uh, take up something which I really wanted to do, especially in the audio industry. When I started my career as a DJ. And uh, I'm a music producer too in the Kannada film industry. I've been making remixes with uh, well-renowned uh, record labels at the present moment. So while I uh, started back then, maybe now the students have multiple options, uh, but it still needs to be reached out to them from the Skill India initiative, not much know about what is Skill India and what are the initiatives and what are the benefits of it. So uh, we had an opportunity as an uh, academician, like my particular institute, somehow the other got tied up with a couple of universities who were uh, providing an opportunity to uh, give them graduation. It's usually vocational studies, which comes only with certifications, more than uh, coming on to the career-oriented uh, stuff. So when it comes in such a way, it's very important to understand that what facility was being available has to be reaching out to the uh, students in a right way, firstly, is what I would say. Uh, there is no much promotions or information being given to the uh, students regarding the said subject. 
I also uh, wholeheartedly request the universities to also consider the entertainment and media subjects as well, because without entertainment and media, especially the subject which I'm into, that's audio, I don't think so it would be surviving. It would be a, na a national news channel, or it could be even this event without a microphone or anything, audio plays a vital role. Just the way, sir, you're a doctor, like, you know, if after a baby is born, the first thing you're gonna pat his ass by saying, you know, is he crying or not? That's the reason, because when he makes a sound, it's alive. So sound is always about alive, you know? So I would say um, uh, with the uh, uh, NEP, which has been uh, you know, given the rules and uh, the latest uh, diversifications with uh, intermingling the, uh, you know, the subjects uh, has also given a great impact. And I think this is something which was really wanted for, I think, my generation, like I'm talking about a decade or 15 decade, 15 years ago, I, I can say we never had opportunities as such. We were restricted to hold on to a few subjects, uh, you know, sorry, uh, to topics as well. But it, it is now an opportunity, and that's going to upscale them, you know, uh, intellectually. I think they can work as team leaders, and I'm sure that they can enhance their skills and make sure they can make a way for themselves. Rather, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, something later that, you know, I would call it as regretting, uh, you know, it shouldn't have happened. They have two possibilities. One, what they wanted to shape up with, as well as they have learned something along with it. Uh, so I think uh, also I would like to say there are a lot of multiple options uh, which the our government has already provided. That is the latest uh, budgets I'm talking about. That's regarding the uh, uh, vocational uh, courses, which uh, I think they have an option for the loan options, if I'm not wrong, about certain amount which has been uh, provided. It's just that through the APAC platform, if I, it could reach out uh, to the concern team and if in case the budget could increase more because th there is a restriction, uh, I could say that you know a 50% of the amount which could be given as a loan sanction only. And I think if it could be increased much more, I think it would be uh, much better for the aspirants uh, is what I could uh, definitely say. Thank you, Ashwin. We Thank all so believe much. that extracurricular activities, what you said about sound, music, it definitely increases the students' performance. And not only really that, social activities, extracurricular activities. We have seen students performing very well. Those students who are particip participating in NSS activity, NS NCC activities, sports activity, and music activity, they perform very well in the classrooms. They may not be the rank holders, but their performance is very good. So uh, with these few words, we have finished the interaction with all the vice chancellors, CEOs, uh, and this message I would like to say will be going across uh, all your institutions. So that is a great thing. And uh, if at all, I think we have got two more minutes. Uh, in that case, uh, we can take some questions. Uh, uh, any, any questions for the speakers, anything? How much time you have? Finished? OK. So if there are any questions, uh, Okay, uh, if there are uh, no questions, uh, uh, maybe one sentence, uh, conclusive remarks. One sentence. We should enable our young people to develop and unleash the talents, the unique talents they bring into this world. Uh, we as the elders actually are not, are never good at predicting the future. Uh, history will tell you that. So whatever talents they bring, help them develop those to the fullest, and I think the future will take care of itself. India is at the cusp of an education revolution in the world, and I think India has the potential to create many, many Oxfords and Harvards within India itself. So uh, normally between a teacher as well as an employer who is interviewing a student, there is a 10 year age gap minimum. And I often like to say that uh, because of this 10 year gap, we fail to understand what the student is capable of or what the student desire is. And therefore it is incumbent upon us to come down and try and understand what the student is about and then base things in and around that rather than putting our notions and expecting those notions to come true in that particular student. I'll uh, quote what uh, John Willie, very famous educationist of US of uh, 20th century said, if you teach as we 
of the, the present generation or today's students, as we did yesterday, we rob their tomorrow. So let us take the technology forward in inculcating recent, recent technologies in all sort of education. Thank you. Okay, the change is here. So let's take the Indian skill global. And I would request all the panelists to assemble for a group photo.